Good afternoon, Sam. Morning, Dr. Hayes. Uh, morning, everybody. And uh, the matter of these presentations was the leak after bariatric surgery, specifically in bypass and sleep. And uh, that's not the presentation, sir. This is the Friday presentation. That's not the presentation. The presentation starts with word acute. The word acute at the beginning, the presentation, please. So these uh, are the worst complications. And endoscopy is uh, now playing a major role in trying to help surgery and solve that, not only on the acute, but on chronic. And besides of my uh, disclosures, I have to disclose that I see the leaks that don't heal. And probably you guys see the leaks that heals. And also I have to disclose that most of this presentation will be over our own experience as a group. So we're gonna talk very few about other groups' experience besides what literature is this. So it's our day by day uh, dealing with those patients. Have you find it? If not, doc, that's it. Thank you. So, how we advance here? By the. Can you click for me? It's not obeying my mouse. You can use a chuck, Manuel. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You see, just wait and I get the better one. So, uh, okay. Let me try to get this. So I, I represent a, a group that had been working with laparoscopic bariatric surgery and bariatric endoscopy for at least uh, 15 years now. This is my disclosures. On the top are, are the ones I already told you. And uh, therapeutic endoscopy has played an advance in bariatric endoscopy. In that part we're gonna take uh, we're gonna cover is about the interface of complications, with complications. And in Brazil, at least, bariatric endoscopy is a very serious matter. You can see here that the endoscopic society, Brazilian endoscopic society, and Brazilian uh, bariatric surgery, they have chapters of bariatric endoscopy. And even our Brazilian DDW with 5,000 people have a full day course uh, for the last five years on that matters. So uh, let's start with the uh, RUNY leaks, and that's the learning objectives of that, uh, that presentation. And uh, leaks and fistula have different ways to be described among that, but it's something that leaks out of uh, the surgical anatomy on that. Incidents varies a lot, and recently it's going lower at the groups of excellency. They have around 1% leak on that. And you can see here, uh, sleeves and bypass have the same amount of, of uh, leaks, but they behave different, as you see. So the group of Dr. Something in Dr. Rosenthal provide us major part of the leaks come on the proximal part of your surgery on that. It's uh, just getting, sorry for that, it's not me, it's the same button. Someone press a button down there. I'm getting there. Okay, the risk of leak literature already provide us and on bypass, you really know when you can have a leak after that. So patients with high risk, difficult surgeries, or you see that you have done something kind of uh, different on that. You have early, you have uh, the, the lay leaks on that, but still, leak is leading and linked to mortality, so that's why we have to take care of this. And the endoscopic anatomy have to be uh, known not only by the surgeons, but mostly for the endoscopies, and the surgeons have to teach the endoscopy how is 
to have a three-dimensional approach to that interluminal anatomy that can describe the anastomosis, the pouch, smaller curvature, greater curvature, anterior and posterior wall. So uh, remember that no matter what, the surgeon has built the anastomosis to be narrow. So the therapeutic window that some points of literature provide us is between 10 to 18 millimeters of diameter. So this, even if my scope passed to, this is an astomosis that was built to be stenotic. And the leaks can be on all of this uh, spectrum that you see on this picture, uh, this slide that you see can vary orientated to disasters uh, on the bed. Very small that I have to guide you, very big on the bottom that you can see drain printed in Portuguese inside the, the leak. We have the gastro, uh, gas, gastro, gastric leaks. We have the more dramatic ones, the gastrobronchial leaks. And uh, we have leaks that are, I'll just let you see that. Six surgeries. Surgeons declare that no access. And what you see in the light is not the alien. It's the endoscope passing to the stomach. By the way, this patient was treated by endoscopy, is now home uh, and safe. So, major thing about endoscopy and leaks, control your patient first. We should not approach endoscopically if surgery had not get inside by laparoscopy, percutane, laparotomy, drain the leak, provide uh, uh, a feeding path that on the run why is very easy with a gastrostomy, mainly stabilize the, the patient before that we, it's our ideal world. And good news about run why leaks, most of them will heal up to 30 days. The ones who don't heal up to 30 days needs some intervention from us. And uh, before, drain gastrostomy in a enteric tube. And the other thing is the traditional endoscopic approach with uh, clips, glue, mesh, please don't waste your time on that. The first thing we must do is remember that this anastomosis was built to be narrow. So dilate it first, then observe the results. And most of them with simple dilations can be, uh, can be controlled. And if it fails, we stent. And we dilate it up to 20 uh, millimeters uh, to uh, assure that you have a flow of uh, liquid air and liquid spacing. So dilation, uh, you see Dr. Uh, Dr. Nathan talking about this, is a very safe uh, measure. Uh, our group have provided a literature review, and you can say here how safe it is. So it's 2.5 rate complications, and even the worst complications perforation, you can just observe clinically most of those patients. It's our own experience, 4% of our series up to 2010, 200 patients, you see just one perforation, not with TTS CRE balloons, but with a salivary guide wire done outside our service. So it's a very safe one. And stents. Stents is a very tricky situation. So first thing is all the stents we use are off-label. Those stents were designed to people that will die in 30 days or no more. And we are using to pe in people that should live. So they don't fit what we need, but it's the only thing we have to use that. But new models should, should come. So what you have, you have the plastic stents, very easy to insert, but they dislodge a lot. And uh, just to show you how we do implant, so this is not a very pleased picture to see. Uh, so patients in general anesthesia, most of them, so you will slide it and you need good x-ray, and you're gonna see here the way we implant. We use these plastic stents because they dislodge if the patient have a huge stenosis, or like this one that have a ring uh, on the stent, and you, because they're gonna keep it in place. You see how we, uh, we open the stent, and how it get on, in place. The good news about these stents, they fit very well, and they are easy to remove. So, uh, Removal, and you can see here that we have provided a bypass from the esophagus into the bowel. 
occluding the hole and bypassing. That's the ideal situation of these stents uh, on this picture here. And to removal, it's kind of easy. You just need an alligator grasper, and you have to just be careful. These, most of those stents can be removed uh, under conscious sedations, and you see here. And very important, once you grab the stent, rotate your scope at least 180 to 170 degrees, and by this rotation, you are able to remove the stand. The good news is if you have a phobe ring there and you shall live for 15, 20 days, the ring will come with the stand. So, but what you can have after is uh, this kind of uh, reaction by the leak seal. So you have also have an option to use metallic single cover stand. They don't dislodge, but maybe you'll not be able to remove them. You see here, three attempts of removal, and then we use an over tube and we grasp the, uh, the stent, put over the over tube, and use the over tube to dig into the tissue. And you can see here on the inferior uh, right corner how ugly is the stent on that. But the new ones, longer, well designed, it's metallic, fully covered, they are coming, and you see here how they can use here. So tips to pass the stent. You see here that the bags are full of air. It means that we are passing the air from the lumen to outside. So then use x-ray, so measure with x-ray, and use a very complex and sophisticated uh, radiological mark, a paper clip. But you can see here how efficient it is in terms of guiding you to position yours. And you see here, uh, above the, the esophagastric junction, esophagastric junction, leak site, and also below that, you need to see where the boa is, so I put a different mark on that. So you are tracking all of this, and we start to passing the, the using a super stiff or a savory guide wire to do so. And you can see here, so very, very short clips. Then, that's the real trick. Put a very fixed position to slide it to. You see we are putting it on the, on the console, and someone put their finger on that. This you need, otherwise you're going to dislodge the, the guide wire inside. This is very critical to put that. And the other thing is, use a 90 degree space for you. This is your personal state, uh, space. And align the sheen of the patient in the neck to uh, allow a good passage of this. And we see here, the stent is, is positioning. Then we open the stent. And a good trick that is that all of the stents use the same approach. You have to fix the distal part of stand on your body, then you're gonna bring the cover into you, into your belly. So all of the, the self-spendable stand use that approach. What we see people is doing the opposite movement, and then you're gonna have a proximal deliver for that. And you see here how we open. So the other thing is, you don't have to open very quickly. You go very slow and you can adjust until you have half of the stent out, you still can adjust proximally or distal the stent. So the intention is to open and to cover all the radiological marks you have done that with that. And then test it to see if you don't have a leak. And you can see here that now the bags are empty. And you compare before and after. So it's a very good sign after stent implant. And even cases that the stream that our group have published, so patient like this, leaking from all over, we did a um, uh, vacuum uh, dressing, and then you can see here on the upper left quadrant that we don't have staple line anymore. And we should we could, we could do a bypass from the esophagus into the bowel, and patient was very good, but nothing is perfect. On those kinds of stand, expect that if you live more than 30 days and if it heals, it will dislodge. And you have to rescue them uh, most of the time you can, but at the end, it pays off with uh, that image that you can barely see what the leak or the opening was. So this is our just up to 2008, very old, uh, casuistic, we are putting more. Now it's more than 50 case treated. You can see a very high uh, fistula closure, but 
remember that you're gonna pay a high price. We used to say that if your patients after stent do not have pain, forget about this, this stent will dislodge the next day. They have pain that need a lot of painkillers. They have reflux. Some stent dislodged and need surgery. So it's a trade-off with your patients that will pay off with a healing rate. If you cannot close with that after, after the stent, you can use procedures like septotomy. So if you see a septum, you can cut the septum and still dilate it so it's gonna help you on that. So you can see how it, it goes. In terms of sleeve gastrectomy leaks, that's the very most tricky one. And we can see here, first is the sleeve gastrectomy uh, endoscopy that was very well uh, explained uh, for our, our previous presentation. Most of you have to care about the incisura and the exit deviation. So if your scope do not slide to the smaller curvature and to pass into the incisura, no more than 15 degrees on up, no more than 15 degrees to the right. More than that, probably you have an exit deviation. So that's the anatomy we already told about. And the learning objective is to see how different it is this leak and how endoscopy can help you on that. And you see here, this is Dr. Breff Hauer uh, review on literature that allows AES and BS to uh, use uh, sleeve gastrectomy as a, a bariatric approach. In the same literature review, you ought to have here, sorry for the busy slide. On your left, you're gonna see high risk patients. On the right, you're gonna see primary procedures. Why high risk have 1.2% leak and primary procedure have 2.7? Very simple. High risk, many stepped approaches, they built over very bold and larger sleeves, and the uh, primary is very narrow one. So you can see here with statistical significance that this science is, uh, was already there a time ago. So narrow the narrow sleeve, more prone to have uh, leaks. I just lost it. Can you pass manually that? Can you press your button? Okay, this is a very nice, nice slide again. 1% on my left hand is run wide gas bypass. 1% of leak in my right hand is leave leak. My left hand, my 1%, 90% heals. The same 1% on the leak, 90% or more become chronic. So the same 1% have different behave. So it needs more assistance. So this is the international consensus that some of us have take part on this, 12,000 case. And this consensus says to us that smaller the, uh, the bougie, more prone to leaks, that uh, the use of stent it can be useful in uh, uh, early leaks. And also this uh, uh, consensus come out with a classification that we are now using to treat uh, endoscopically. Uh, our homework is to promote a uh, literature review with the wording sleeve gastrectomy leak and endoscopic treatment. Start on 300 papers reviewed, ending on 38 papers. So, and it is a very, very busy slide, but very simple to understand. On the stream right, the only words you see are stent. So that's what literature have to offer you. And stent for early, for chronic, for mid-size, wherever. And this is what literature offers in terms of endoscopic treatment up to now. And what is the pathophysiology? Like these beautiful cumulonimbus skies that can take down a triple seven plane uh, by its own. And you can see here why. Vascular supply of the stomach is perfect except for one spot, his angle. The his angle have three layers of muscle. There is some research on cadavers showing us that people can be ischemic genetically on his angle. Uh, also, they have a physiologic obstruction of an innocent guy, that is the pelvidorus. You have different shapes and pitfalls. Dr. Nathan, I'm gonna pass to you all of these. I just pass it very briefly. That the stenosis on sleeve gastrectomy that contributes on the leak is very difficult to, to understand that. Like these ones and these ones. So, uh, 
more than that, it is so high that it's under the negative pressure of the thorax that you keep it alive. You have a complex, long and tortuous path. You have the longest staple line with weak spot in between where the staple line uh, ends and begins another one. It's a very thick uh, situation. And uh, before last year, our staples closing high, they were, doesn't match with the thickness of all of the stomach. And groups like Dr. Uh, something, Dr. Rosenthal has provided us with very good data that we are building a hyperpressive system after we do a zip gastrectomy with a weak spot that hits his angle. So imagine that over that we are very creative. We do this very restrictive procedure and put a ring on that. So if you have a leak, sure you're going to have a leak that's going to last for long. So what the strategy? You see here on, on that picture, we have stents, we have cutting, we have balloon dilation, not the regular hydrostatic dilation, but using real tough dilation with pneumatic balloons. So we are following this uh, classification now of the consensus, and we will provide you probably at the end of this year with the publication between 70 and 100 cases of sleeve leaks treated by this group using this classification uh, retrospectively study that we are preparing to, to, to show. So you used to say that we stent it early and then we dilate and cut it early. Using the classification, the classification is acute, early, later, and chronic. You can see here the date. But mainly acute and early, put in almost the same manner, and later in chronic, uh, the similar way that I'm going to show you right now. So acute leaks, we stent on that. And if the bypass, and you can see the cases we are treating, needs very particular stents, Ziv gastrectomy needs even more particular ones. The stents you have in the market here in the US, the longest ones, for, uh, except for colon, have 15 centimeters, and the larger diameter is 23 millimeters, so that's not enough. Or it means that when you put the stent, you have to choose in between occluding the hole or passing the incisura, and that's not enough. So most of, of, uh, of the service put two stents, but if you see the physical law with a stent and a stent, once they bend, they tend to do this and break too. So that's not the, the IG on that. So this is what I have stated. Can you have? Okay, good. New ones are coming. So we have Korean stents, we have stents done in South America, longer and wider, that can really cover from the esophagus into duodenum. And they are fully covered. And I'm about to show you, this is the situation we face all of the time with stents we have. You can see clearly on the radiological image that we haven't passed in cesura. This kind of situation will leak on the next day. They will not leak on the up, but they leak on the bottom around the stent. Ideally, we need this. You need to cover from the esophagus, you see the radiological marks, up to the, at least the entrum. And the new stents are coming. And you will see here one of those new stents. So we are using, again, the very sophisticated uh, radiological marks, paper clips. And those marks, you can see here, they are on esophagastic junction, incisura, and pylorus. Then you put your stent respecting those marks. And then you start open those stents. And you can see here that as you open or as you pass through, you put the curve away of your marks because of the pressure to pass the incisura. And now you're open. And you can clearly see and that after you open, you have a very serious situation of those stents. The thing that allowed you open that is inside, when you are pulling this out, have to be very careful not to pull all the stent out, passing to the incisura that you're just going to see right now. So once you're open, you test it to see if it's no leak, leave into place no more than two months. And then they are very easy to remove because they are fully covered on that. For early leaks, you start with stent, but expect that you need something more. So you start with stent, then you go and use a calasia balloon uh, dilation that is this specific one this is the one we like it. And you can see on the right uh, uh, 
right corner that we use general anesthesia, and this is not hydrostatic, it's, it's pneumatic dilation. Next picture, you can see radiological, im oh, sorry, endoscopic image on the top, radiological image on the, on, the, on the bottom. You can see 10 PSI, 15 PSI, 20 PSI, and pay attention with the axis, how aggressive is this dilation. If you look the Im endoscopic image, we are seeing through the balloon, and you can see really how aggressive we are. Later leaks are different. We see, we see here no use for stents. So we start, if later leaks, we start with balloons, and then we go and do a septotomy. All of these leaks, 90 plus percent, you have the leak site, then you have the lumen, and you have a septum in between. The leak site is higher than the lumen, so the flow, food flow, tends to go on the leak. So using some Zenker diverticulum uh, learnings, we cut, as you can see in the image of the middle, uh, we cut this leak. In chronic, we start cutting, and then we balloon dilate. You're gonna see very, uh, in very brief images where I'm almost uh, ending. You see here, we are on the lumen. On the right, we see the cavity, and can this image be more chronic for the one who don't believe us? The piranha bite of this? So this is real chronic on site, that have it, every single characteristic. And not to shock you, we're gonna use here argon plasma, but generally we cut with needle knives and uh, a cautery on that you see again. And the septum is very clear, so we start cutting, and you also can see a clip that was used on a previous failed attempt to do that, that only uh, lets us to remove this clip was kind of hard. So you cut, you can use a cap, we can use a sophisticated manner, but you can do just like this. And very aggressive, you have to cut up to the muscular layer. And don't, don't care, and sorry, don't be afraid if you, if you perforate that. It's already perforated, you already have the leak. So, uh, gear up. So let's see the progression of this. So you say, we remove the clip, and you can see here uh, the progression of this. And uh, as soon as we have enough space, we start cutting from the inside to outside. And after you finish your cutting, you need something to stretch it up to the muscular layer. And so how can we do that? With the achalasia balloon. So you see we reposition this balloon, this passage is over the scope balloon, and we will position exactly on the cutting side, and we start uh, inflating. You see here the cutting line on your uh, left hand, so you're stretching this. And we do three, four uh, sessions on those if necessary. And after that, what you see, After that, what you see, the last, uh, the last image, is that we, we are showing you that we have cut up to the muscular layer. Endoscopies will recognize this layer. And you see here that now the lumen is more uh, on its sides and uh, correcting the axis. And we can see here how it was in the, the, uh, the very first uh, uh, treatment of this. And it's clear we have uh, less cavity for that. So, Calasia balloon dilation, and this is what we have on the endoscopic image before and after, uh, and you see the radiological image of the chronic leak. And believe me that this approach on run by gas bypass and sleeve gastrectomy, uh, endoscopic treatment can be used in worst case scenarios that we have published 15 cases of gastrobronchial fistulas, that on these images you see that we are treating very serious complication, and those 15, uh, 14 of those could be treated endoscopically uh, with good results. And for that, uh, and your patients, I really wanted to thank you, the invitation, and the opportunity to speak on myself and Dr. Campus. Thank you very much. Get a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, the first question, um, do you have any experience with degradable or temporary stents for leak management and do they help uh, close the fistula without the need for stent retrieval? No, uh, I, we don't have this kind of stents in, in Brazil, I don't think in Latin America, but what I expect is it's a major tissue reaction of that. So that's the, the publications about that is scarce. I, I can remember some Congress presentations, but not a single uh, 
publication on that. So those stands, they, I have saw them, they are very small because of the way they are built on that. That for a, a bypass, probably yes, but for sleeve gastrectomy, they have to build one. And the, po the, other, the other problem is that the radial force of expansion on those uh, uh, absorbable ones are not the same as a plastic and uh, nitinol ones. So we have to, to balance that. Another question, uh, why not use interluminal clips as a radiologic marker instead of paper clips? The passage of scope can move the sleeve in relation to the skin level. Uh, okay, uh, first thing is uh, the endoscopic clips, they were designed to fall. The design of these clips that you put there to stay, the des they were designed after you clip it because they were designed for bleeding. They will fall. So if you pass your scope, they, most of them will dislodge it. What we do, we paste, put the patients on the back position, not on the, the regular position from left lateral for endoscopy, and we see that those clips doesn't move with the skin. Most of them, and you can really have, and it's changed our life. We used to inject lipoiodol, a lot of things in the luminal, and we don't do that anymore. Those very simple marks with the patient laying on their back is very reliable, at least for our series. And cheap like hell. Uh, another question, Manuel. Do you find any reason today for a patient with a sleeve leak to take it to the operation room? Yes. Uh, after the leak, if the leak is not drained, they have to be drained. So that's, that's what we see. And we will fail by endoscopy in some cases, but now we know the cases will fail. So what I don't see is why, if you have the resources, why not give endoscopy a chance for at least three interventions, and after that, together, and that's the main, the main message, we cannot do that alone. Endoscopy cannot do that on their own. They need the surgeon together. They need the patient, the family, expose what we have, the facts, and have to do it together. What I don't see is why not give minimally invasive a chance. And I see around uh, a lot of very nice presentations that you do total gastrectomies, you do conversions from ruin by gas bypass, and it's beautiful for the ones who present. But after the presentation, we, we receive much more requesting from endoscopic uh, treatment from the audience. Uh, and Alice, one question. At what point do you give up and you say, I'm not going to treat this endoscopically. I've either got to resect it uh, and, and just change, change the anatomy altogether. Okay. This is like this. Uh, for sleeve gastrectomy, that's tougher. We cannot keep the lumen open, so we cannot keep the flow. If you are on the third or fourth attempt, that we start talking with the surgeon. The main driving for surgery is the surgeon and the family. So if they wanted to keep up with endoscopy, if the patient is progressing, we keep on that. So we are seeing no progression, uh, no improvement, and we are achieving the third, the fourth sessions. That's the time that we should talk together and take into consideration the clinical uh, condition of the patient also. Thank you very much. Thank you.